Hey, listen, I really don't even remember how far I got last week, to be honest with you. I was looking back. I thought that I had gone through all four of them, but I don't think that I covered Thyatira. Uh, we're going through the churches, um, <clears throat> but I, I, I'm not going to go through the whole church of Thyatira because I can't remember if I covered it or not. But there's just a couple of spots that I wanted to point out to you because I think in the future, I'm definitely going to bring this up. Definitely maybe when we get to uh, Revelation 12, possibly. And there may be other spots too, but so this is talking about the church of Thyatira right now. And this is Revelation chapter two, verse 26. And it says, and, then, and, and you know this, again, I mentioned this last week, but I want to mention it again. The more I slow down and read, because I wasn't even going to cover the churches. I'm going to be honest with you. I was going to jump right into the seals and start talking about end time events and things of that nature. But I really felt like the Lord kind of like spoke to me and said, no, you need to cover the churches. And what's happening, the more I slow down, the more I read about the churches, the more I realize, you know, the, the words that, that the Lord put into these messages for the churches are so important. You know, um, I realize that my brain might work a little bit different than other people's brains. And I tend to slow down and dissect, at least whenever I'm studying, I'm sitting here dissecting. I'm like, man, this is so good. This is so much, so rich. You know what I'm saying? Uh, not, yeah, not, not rich like rich, but but rich like tasty. You know? And you may not even see it that way. And I get it. And I apologize if I if I if I get over if I overwhelm you with with things like that. But to me, there's some meat in here that the Lord's speaking to the church, and you are the church. So I just Amen. want you to know that. Yeah. Amen? But look, and one, and another thing that kept sticking out to me, and I, I think I tried to explain this, people look at the church age, there's been differing opinions uh, about how to look at these churches, these seven churches that were seven literal churches in Asia Minor. We already talked about that. We looked at a map already. Um, and that John, the, the beloved that wrote this letter of Revelation, while he was a prisoner on the Isle of Patmos, was actually the bishop in the church, of, uh, the bishop over these churches, and he was pastor in Ephesus, is my understanding of things that I've read. And um, so there were seven literal churches, but at the same time, it's obvious that in each one of these messages, God had a message for the church of all time. Amen. Right. And because you're the church of all time, God has a message for you through this. And so one of the things that I want you to know is, is that as you go back and you study the word of God for yourself, because I'm going to venture and trust that if you come to this church, <clears throat> that you that you do that you want to study the word of God, even though none of us ever have enough time to study as much as we want to. Nevertheless, when you go back through the book of Revelation and you're remembering this, I want you to, to remember that God has a message for his people in here. And one of the repetitive things is it keeps saying, he who overcomes, he who overcomes. I was actually kind of tempted to, when I was done with the church, is to go back and just have a review night, even though some people think can't tolerate review too much. But whenever, to go back and just to hit the overcoming state. If you overcome this, if you overcome, then this. If, uh, if you overcome Ephesus, then this. If you overcome, tonight we're on Thyatira, then this. If you overcome Sardis, if you overcome Laodicea. He's got a message for the overcoming church. Right. If you overcome until the end, then this is going to happen. So I want you to know that it's definitely speaking to people about the end. Now... When those people were alive 2,000 years ago in Asia Minor, they had an end too. And nobody really ever knows when the Lord's coming back. And the closer each day comes, the closer he comes to his return. But nevertheless, for your individual life, amen, for my individual life, there's going to be an end. We may go to see him in the clouds one day, but even if we don't and we go to sleep in Christ, the Lord wants you and I to know he's got a message for overcomers. And if you overcome, then this. Amen. And so we're just gonna we're just gonna talk real quickly about the message of overcoming it to Thyatira, and then we're gonna go ahead and get into Sardis. Okay? It says, He and he that overcomes, this is Jesus, and keeps my works unto the end. Now, now that's an important thing for us to remember. I'm not listen, you're part of a church that believes that, that believes that people can turn their back on the Lord. I believe that. I don't know when a person gets to the point where they've apostatized from the faith. 
I'm not the Holy Spirit, and I don't want that job. Amen? But what I'm trying to say is, is that I believe that when I, with the kind of church I was saved in was a Pentecostal type church. It was a full gospel charismatic church. And much of the message that was preached was, if you miss church, I don't know y'all heard me say this before, but if you miss church on Wednesday and the rapture happened, you probably weren't going to make it. I don't believe that. I don't believe that. So it's okay, Naya, we're praying for you to get better. Amen, if you're watching. You, listen. I don't believe that, but at the same time, I don't. We do have security in our salvation. I do believe that we have eternal security in our salvation in Christ. But I also believe that sin introduced into the life of the believer can begin to erode his faith. Sin will begin to erode the the faith is like soil that holds the root system together. And if you let the, the waves of sin lap on your shore long enough, it'll start to, to cause you to shake. And, and whether we like it or not, I'm telling you right now, it can come to the enemy will not will not quit. And many times we are left in a place in our walk with God or in our life on this earth where we're imagining that we're okay and reality is, is that we may not be. And that's all I'm trying to say. And I'm going to give you another scripture also later on. I believe I put it in here where the apostle Paul said, just because I don't see anything wrong doesn't make it so. Amen. Okay. So, so I just want you to, I just want you to see that, but he who keeps the works into the end, that's how I got off on that. He who keeps the works until the end. We're supposed to serve God until the end. Amen? We all go through seasons, but we're not really supposed to be taking breaks from the Lord. Amen? We're supposed to serve Him to the end. To Him will I give power over the nations. I want you to see this. And He, look at this, He shall rule them with a rod of iron. As the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers. That's like a a piece of pottery that's hit with a rod of iron and just crumbles to, to sh and shattered, even as I received of my father. Now, the main reason that I wanted to point this particular scripture out is because at another time we will talk about this, this rod of iron. And I'm going to give you and share with you what my interpretation of Revelation 12 is. Whenever I do, you may not completely agree with me, and I'm okay with that. Really, I'm very comfortable with that. But I'm going to share with you my interpretation because it talks about this rod of iron. And there's other passages in the entirety of the word of God that repeatedly refer to Jesus as the one having the rod of iron. But I'm trying to make a point right now to tell you that this isn't talking about Jesus. This is saying that believers that overcome until the end will have a rod of iron, that they will also rule over the nations just as he has been given that authority from his father. We will also be given that authority through Christ. Why? Because he has called, he has saved us and called us to be kings and priests from every tongue, tribe, and nation. We've been redeemed by the blood of the lamb and we will rule with him. Amen. Yeah. We don't know exactly what it's going to look like during the thousand years, but we're going to rule with the Lord. I believe that, man. I believe the word of God more tonight than I did last week. We will rule and reign with Jesus Christ. He will set up his throne upon this earth. He will rule from the throne of David and we will rule and reign with him. Amen. 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 All right. So that was the main thing I wanted you to see about Thyatira. Now we're moving on to Sardis. Sardis is starting in chapter 3, verse 1, and it says, and we're just going to go ahead and read it. It says, And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write these things, says he that has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Now, I got to tell you that there's a couple of other scriptures uh, coming out of Revelation chapter 5, verse 6. We can look at that real quick. And I beheld, because it this is, a, this is something that I felt like we should mention is the seven spirits. Because I got to tell you, I know I said it a while back. There's not seven Holy Spirits. Okay. There's one Holy Spirit. Right. But it's describing the seven attributes or aspects of the Holy Spirit. Amen. But, I want you, but one thing I want you to see, because it says it right here in Revelation 5 also, is the close union between the Lamb and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You can't separate the sacrifice right. from the moving and operation of the Holy Spirit. You know, we can have so much of the word and so focused on the cross, not the, not the wooden beam itself. That's just an altar of sacrifice that the Lord allowed, that God allowed our Lord to die on. 
but we can't be so focused on the sacrifice without understanding the, the, the moving and operation of the Holy Spirit through the sacrifice and vice versa. You can't have moving and operation of the Holy Spirit and be like like those people in red in California. Be like, oh my gosh, look at the glory cloud. And everybody's focused on some, some shiny stuff that's up in the corner. Listen, the devil is an angel of light. Do you understand that? He can manifest things. I, I don't yes. know why I'm going up on this because I can't help myself. He can manifest. He's a spiritual being that can cause things. He can cause deceivable works of unrighteousness. He, he will allow his, he will allow people in the end, the Antichrist will call fire down from heaven. The, the two, the two, what, the two what, people that work, the magicians that work for Pharaoh turn their rods into snakes too. My point is, is that just because you see people were coming out of, and, and you know, Shane's been around long enough, he probably remembers this, They're, and maybe even Bridget, they were getting gold fillings in their teeth. All of a sudden, they went to the, gold dust. Look, look at my Bible, dude, it's got gold dust in it. Look, I don't mean to be weird to you, but whenever I started studying the history of the occult, they had, they had things that they were talking about where they could, uh, alchemy. What they were practicing forms of magic, and the whole point to alchemy was that you turn one type of uh, non-precious metal into a precious metal. That was what the whole thing. So that's just some weird stuff, okay? But they were so focused on that. They're like, look, I got gold dust in my Bible. I got gold fillings in my Bible, but ain't nobody living for the Lord. You see what I'm saying? And so I'm just trying to say that, listen, the Spirit of God is very closely connected to the Lamb. And look, it says it right here. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a Lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God. Amen. So we're going back to Revelation chapter 3, verse 1. But while I go there actually to the spirit documentation i want you to now i'm going to bring you to isaiah because this is where in isaiah it's talking about and I, I apologize you can't really see this too well so let me pull it over for you and the spirit of the lord shall rest upon him talking about messiah talking about jesus this is old testament this is 700 about 756 bc 700 years before jesus the prophet says about messiah that the spirit of the Lord will rest upon him. That's number one. The spirit of wisdom, number two. The spirit of understanding, number three. The spirit of counsel, number four. The spirit of might, number five. The spirit of knowledge, number six. The spirit of fear, number seven. So there you got seven attributes or seven aspects of the Holy Spirit. Um, when the Holy Spirit would overshadow Mary, uh, you know, Naya just preached on that. And then whenever you and I also, when we get saved, the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of us. And that's really what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is really all about. It's about more of the spirit of God so that we can see more of Jesus so that we can be witnesses for Jesus so that the more of the Holy Spirit you have, the more clearly you see the Lord, the more, the more desire you have for the Lord, the more, desire you have to do the work of the Lord. Amen? Amen? And that's really what it's about. So he says right here to, um, he says that he's the one with the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, which were the pastors or the angels. I know your works and you have a name. And this is the name. This is, this is your name that you are, that you live and are dead. So Jesus says, I know your works and I know your name. And this is your name that you live, but you're really dead. And so one of the things about a name in the Bible is, is that definitely when it's talking about the name of Jesus, but really and truly names have authority, you know, like, so if you and I are the bride and Jesus is the bridegroom, whenever we use the name of Jesus, so whenever you have a bride and she marries her husband, she now takes upon his name. I'm not trying to be male chauvinist, but that's typically how things are done. And, but she, if he had a bank account, now she comes and she becomes his bride. And so now they're sharing a bank account. She can now sign checks with the name of her husband. She's operating in the authority of that name. That's just an illustration to describe our relationship with Jesus. We have authority in the name of Jesus. And that, listen, that's a good name to be connected to. Amen. I believe there's power in the name of Jesus. 
We don't always see it manifest right before our eyes. But when we utilize the name of Jesus, when we say the name of Jesus, I'm telling you right now, it'll cause a reverberation in the spirit realm. When you start using the name of Jesus, it's going gonna, it's gonna to cause something to happen. Amen. <clears throat> But you know, the, the word name also in the Bible has to do with the concept of character, right? And anytime you, you say a name, I mean, we don't have to use human names, but I'm just saying, if you say a name, if somebody, if somebody uses my name, the reality of it is they got a whole lot of people probably with differing opinions about Matt Abair. But I'm just, right? I mean, let's just be real. I'm using myself as an example, so I ain't got to make y'all feel weird. That's what I do. So if you go out there in, in public and you say, hey, man, you know Matt Abair? So you use that name, guess what? It immediately evokes a thought, right? It evokes an opinion in somebody's brain. Matt Abair, oh, yeah, I know that dude. Okay, or, you know, my daddy used to say, Matt, don't tell nobody who your daddy is. <laughs> don't do it. You know, one day I go to this party. I don't remember what it was. A wedding reception or something. And I meet this guy. And he and I he, hey, what's your name, son? Uh, my name's Matt Abear. Well, who's your daddy? I mean, this is in Lafayette. It's kind of a big city. I didn't expect this dude to know my dad. But I guess I looked like him. I don't know. He's like, I said, Jimmy. He's like, I knew your dad. I went to college. He slapped me. <laughs> I'm like, Dad, I just met some guy and he said you slapped him. He said, I told you. Don't tell anybody who your daddy is, boy. Anyway, completely different thing. But nevertheless, when you say a name, it evokes an opinion. So what Jesus was saying is you have a name. There's a reputation connected to you. And what people think about you is that you're alive. But I know the truth. You're not really alive. You're really dead. Now, that's the Lord saying that. I think that that's a sobering message for each and every one of us as the body of Christ to be reminded of sometimes we think more highly of ourselves. I don't know about you, but that's what it checks my spirit. Kind of gives me a little bit of a gut check and says, hey, Matt, just because you think you're alive, just because other people might think you're alive. You see what I'm saying? I'm not trying to say that the Lord's saying I'm dead. That's not what I'm trying to say. I'm just trying to make a point that sometimes people imagine or view certain people a certain way and the real concern and question is how is the lord viewing the whole thing amen That's right. viewing the whole thing amen That's right. he so he says this he says be watchful be watchful and strengthen the things that remain and are ready to die you know this word be watchful is the same exact word that we see in first peter 5 8 it says, be sober, be vigilant, be watchful. Why? Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. I got to tell you that I just preached a funeral service right before I came over here. You know, and in that congregation of people, there were several people that I know for a fact that have been in our church services on multiple occasions. I'm just trying, all I'm, the, my only point to all of that is to say that I know that the enemy is trying to destroy me just like he's trying to destroy you, just like he's trying to destroy you, just like he's trying to destroy them. The word of the Lord tells us right here that we're to be vigilant or watchful and that we're to be sober because our adversary, the devil, see, uh, roams around like a roaring lion and he's seeking whom he may devour. And so... He's saying that, listen, you need to be watchful and you need to strengthen the things which remain. Now, I don't, I'm not trying to say that the Lord gave me this whole message of Sardis for our church. But I do remember about two months ago, I was praying and I felt like the Lord told me, strengthen what remains. And, you know, I just, what I took from that was, was that we needed to, we needed to focus on where we already were. And sometimes, you know, as a, as pastors, we can, we can, or as preachers, whenever you have a congregation, you have a building, you have people that come, you, you can start, I've seen preachers do it before. We can start casting a lot of vision and have a lot of plans, but I feel like, you know, what the Lord was saying to me is, man, you, you gotta, you already have something and you need to continue to strengthen what you already have. Amen. And so maybe you can help me pray that the Lord will give us even more wisdom regarding that. And, and what he means, but he says, listen, 
Strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard and hold fast. So I want to encourage you and I want to encourage you to encourage others that you may know that the word of the Lord for every church of all times is I want you to remember what you have received and what you've heard. What have you received? You know, I was sharing with those people tonight that some way, somehow you heard about the Lord. Amen. And all of us are in that same boat. I even I said it. I don't know who you are, those people that were there tonight, because everybody like where you are spiritually speaking, you know, because when you speak to a crowd of people, some people may not even believe in God. But I can guarantee you at some point in time, people have at least thought about God. Amen. And you you're at another level because you've believed in God. You've heard the word of the Lord. You've received the word of the Lord. Amen. And the Lord is saying right here, remember what you've received. Remember what you've heard and hold fast to it. You know, this is kind of like, it's not really, I think of, you know, like the woman with the issue of blood, holding fast to something, gripping it. She was desperate. She, she reaches through the crowd. She grabs a hold of the hem of his garment. I imagine somebody desperate and and clinging to the leg of another person and they're like, they're like oh my gosh get, you know what I'm saying I, I even thought of your daughter Lainey because the other day Haley said watch what she does when I put her down and she put her down and, and Lainey was like you know pick me back up and she was clinging because of course I was messing with her and she thought I was going to come get her but but hold fast the, the clinging to the holding on to right and the Lord's saying listen You've received, the, you've received me. You received my word. Hold fast to that and repent. If therefore you will not watch, I will come on you as a thief. Listen, there's a lot of scriptures in the word of God. I'm not going to go to each one of them for the sake of time. But if you happen to be taking notes, look, 1 Thessalonians 5, 2, 2 Peter 3, 10, Revelation 16, 15, and each one of those. It's, it says the day of the Lord is like a thief in the night. The day of the Lord is like a thief in the night. You know, he says, if you don't watch, I will come upon you as a thief. You know, typically, you know, I don't, I don't know that I was a, a great thief. Unfortunately, I have probably stole some things in my life, but some people are good at stealing, right? At least that's what I've heard. Some people are so slick at stealing, you, they, they, you know, they're creating a diversion over here. You don't even see they put something in their pocket over here. I was trying to think about what it would be like whenever a thief, you know, like sometimes somebody might steal something from your house and you don't even know it's gone for two months, three months. You didn't even know it was gone. You didn't even realize it. But they, that, them people come, came in your house, took your stuff, and then two, three months later, you're starting to realize Somebody came in here and stole my stuff. It's going to happen like a thief in the night. For people that are not prepared, that they're not watchful, that they're not vigilant. Listen, that can happen to each and every one of us in this place, if we're honest. That can happen to anybody watching the video tonight. Because guess what? We get caught up with the cares of the world. We get caught up with the cares of the world. We get caught up with the grind of life. We're so busy in our relationships. And listen, relationships are important. I'm not taking away from that. We're so busy at our job. Jobs are important. We're so busy with our children. With the kids are important. All of that stuff is important. But we get so busy with all of that. That it's, it, it, listen, the, the enemy will come in and he'll cause our eyes. We'll get some spiritual cataracts and we're not so watchful. And then the next thing you know, he comes in, the Lord saying, listen, I'm going to come in like a thief at an hour. He says, and you shall not know what hour I will come upon you. See, the word hour there can be interpreted as a as season. There's going to be a season. I believe we're in a season right now, my friend. I mean, am I saying Jesus is coming back tomorrow? No, I'll be clear about that. But I am think we're in a season. Like something's going on in the world that we live in, I believe. Yes. And I don't know that everybody is being that watchful and is that aware of it. Sometimes when I talk to people, I'm like, do you not think that the world's changing before our eyes? That's all I'm just trying. I'm just trying to get you. I guess I'm getting, trying to get you to agree with me. I'm not trying to brainwash anybody. <laughs> that, 
I asked Nadia to, to check out to see. There, I did a, a Mardi Gras video a long time ago, and I said because she was telling me about another one, and I said how many views I got on that other one because I don't get very many views, and it was like five thousand people. But she starts reading the comments, and she says, "This woman right here, listen to what this woman said about you." She said, "Look at him, he's crazy." Everything that he's saying is crazy. Obviously, she loved Mardi Gras. And she's like, he's crazy. This can't be true. He's acting crazy. Look at him. He's even acting crazy. Something's wrong with him. She said, I think he's brainwashed. He's definitely brainwashed. You know? <laughs> and and, 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 and what, what, I'm not trying to brainwash anybody. I'm really not. I'm just, I'm not, I don't think I'm trying to get you to agree with me. But I'm kind of curious. Do you not think something's happening on the earth that's different? Do you not feel something's yep. different? I feel something's different. And I don't want to get lost in the season of things happening, in the hour of things happening, because I wasn't being watchful, and I, I couldn't even see. I didn't even have spiritual headlights to see what was going on in front of me. And, and, and the Word of God says in Psalm 119 that, that His Word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. God wants to illuminate what's going on, amen? And we got to stay close to the Word and close to the Lord, amen? Yes. He goes on to say, you have a few names there in Sardis that have not defiled their garments and that they will walk with me in white. I can tell you that white garments represent the, the gift of righteousness that have been given to believers by the Lord. Amen. When he purchased righteousness for us by giving us his righteousness. And look at this. Here's that other overcoming message. And, I, and again, I want you to know this letter was definitely written regarding end time events. So if you and I happen to be here when the end does come, this letter was written specifically for us. Amen. But it, again, it was also important for each believer that may go to sleep in Christ to understand that the Lord has a message for the overcomer. And he says this to Sardis, he that overcomes the same shall be clothed in white raiment. Do you not see the persistent pattern of how God is connecting the overcomer to the end of days. I want you to see that. Because see the white raiment. If I brought you. There's a lot of other scriptures. Uh, where where the white raiment. Is actually. Uh, we'll look right here. You could, I mean you could, we could go. We could look at a couple of them. Revelation 3.18. Well we're going to go to that one anyway later. So look at this. Uh, round, about, round about the throne. Round about the throne were 24 seats, and upon the seats I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white raiment. There's other scriptures that we, that we could go to that would repetitively show the white raiment, amen, and, and the being clothed. Now, I will tell you that there's an interesting, um, there's an interesting concept in throughout the, there's an interesting theme throughout the word of God that has to do with being clothed and if you think about it um, it says that in the beginning we don't know this is speculation you can't prove this but something was obviously up with Adam and Eve because there was a period of time before the fall where they obviously didn't know they were naked does that make sense because all of a sudden when they fell into sin now it's like they're aware that they're naked so scholars have speculated that they were clothed in the glory of God, that they were concealed by God's glory. They didn't have any. Now, again, we can't prove that. But what we do know is, is that as soon as they fell into sin, they attempted to cover and clothe themselves with fig leaves. All right. So they attempted to cover themselves with the works of their own hands. They're like, oh my gosh, we're naked before God, and they wanted to hide before the Lord. So they had, and that could be like that could be like the works of religion. That could be like me trying to fix my situation, whatever. They cover themselves with fig leaves, but what does God say? That's not gonna work. Amen. And he provides the first sacrifice. And he clothes them with the sacrifice of an innocent animal. Okay. Then when you move forward in time, you see all kinds of things have, having to do with you know, I, I could sit here and talk about Joshua, the high priest and the vision, you know, but, but the main thing is, is that there's an idea that whenever we put our faith in Christ, we've been clothed with him. As a matter of fact, it says that something to that effect in Galatians 3.27, that when you're baptized into Christ, you've put him on. And the idea in the Greek is that you've been clothed with Christ Jesus. And so today, as we sit here, you and I have been, as believers, 
You may not understand it that way. I hope you do. You've been clothed by faith because you put your faith in his sacrifice. You've been clothed with his righteousness. You've been covered with his righteousness. When you really begin to believe that, I'm telling you some spiritual stuff will start to happen. You got to first, you got to know it. Then you, then you can, once you know it, you can start believing it. Once you start believing it, then you can start walking in the benefits of it. Amen. And when you start walking in the bit, I didn't really spend a lot of time on there, but whenever it said the seven attributes of the Holy Spirit and four of them were stuck out to me, knowledge, wisdom, understanding, and counsel. See, I love those words because Proverbs is full of them. And, you, and it starts off with the knowledge of God. If you, knowledge is informational. Sorry, my friend. If you don't like to read and to hear the word of God being preached by somebody that studies the word of God, you're going to have a hard time learning the word of the Lord. How are you going to know God if you don't know his word? Knowledge starts with information and you have to somehow you've got to put that information on the inside of you. Once you start putting the information of God on the inside of you and you take it out there with you, guess what? You get the opportunity to apply that information in life circumstances. Man, did you hear the way that you talked to me? Did you hear the way they treated me whenever I went over here? Did you hear? Yeah, guess what? The word of the Lord will tell you to humble yourself. The word of the Lord will tell you that you don't have to always be vindicated. Amen. The word of the Lord will tell you that God is your defender. Amen. And But now you got to practice it. Listen, you can't just be it. We can't. I say you. We, we can't just be Christians in theory. You know, I'm just going to be real with you. I mean, we go around and we have in this church for a long time. I think we've kind of come down a notch. Hopefully. But we were like, man, we got the truth. <laughs> we got the truth of the gospel, the message of the cross. Okay, well, praise God. But guess what? The message of the cross is an instrument of death. And the old man's supposed to die. <laughs> and a new man's supposed to be resurrected. And he's supposed to be filled with the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Spirit is a whole lot different than the spirit of the world. And so we ought not be acting like the world. We ought to be acting more like Jesus. Because the word of God says... To being conformed into the image of his son. That means you're being molded. The Holy Spirit's molding you. Amen? So, I just want to say that when you're clothed in white raiment, you've been clothed in the righteousness of Jesus. Amen? And listen, you got to put that knowledge in there about this. It turns into wisdom. Amen? And the Lord will begin to reveal those things to us. He says this, he also will not blot out our name out of the book of life. So, I mean, I'm just kind of curious if he says, I won't blot out your name. Does that mean that some people will have their names yep. blotted out? Yep. It's a good question, right? But instead, I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Have you ever been in, in school? Like, I don't know. I didn't think about this earlier, but I'm thinking about it right now. You know how kids are kind of cruel. Were you a cruel kid growing up or were you pretty nice to people? I don't know. I don't, I don't think I was as nice to people as I should have been. And, you know, kids are mean, man. They make fun of people and, and bully people and stuff like that. But uh, I don't know. I've at least seen it on a movie before where people were friends one day and, and the next day they're around a different crowd of people. And guess what? <laughs> oh, I don't know you. Right? I don't know you. I've even not just seen it on a movie. I've seen it happen <coughs> in real life with young people. Like, I'm embarrassed all of a sudden. I don't know you. Right. And I don't know. I'm just saying, like, the Lord's saying, I'm not going to blot out your name. And and I will confess your name before my father and before his angels. Amen. That's a good thing. Right. But but I've got to tell you, there's another spot in one of the Gospels where he said, if you're ashamed of me, I'm going to be ashamed of you. And I don't know about you, but I know there's been times in my Christian walk that I've been embarrassed. I wasn't always as bold. Where an opportunity came up and all of a sudden I clammed up and I shut up and I was like, oh, I know I'm supposed to talk for Jesus, but I can't say nothing right now. And then I would read that scripture and, and I would feel so condemned and guilty. Like, oh my gosh, I had an opportunity to talk about Jesus and I didn't. And I was scared and it would just make it worse. Listen, God doesn't want us operating like that. He wants us to be free to talk about the Lord. Amen. But he does want us to talk, to freely talk about the Lord. Amen. He that has an ear to hear, let, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Amen. Now we're going into Philadelphia. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia. You know the word Philadelphia means brotherly love. Uh, he says, these things says he 
that is holy, he that is true, he that has the key of David. Now, this is this is kind of interesting right here in Isaiah. Let me see where I am before I go back. We're in uh, Revelation 3, 7. The key of David, Isaiah 22, 22. In the Old Testament, again, it says, it's talking about Messiah when he comes. And the key, he will have the key of the house of David, will I lay upon his shoulders, so he shall open and none shall shut, and he shall shut and none shall open. Praise God. You know, like there's obviously, this is a reference to this passage out of Isaiah when it's talking about the future day when the Messiah will come. And it says right here that he has the key of David and he that opens and no man shuts and shuts and no man opens. This is something that's really been on my heart and in my mind lately as I see the world changing before me. And as I've already read the Bible and I kind of, I'm just saying like, I kind of know, I believe that I'm starting to understand the end of what's going to happen. Okay, and I try to, by the grace of God, fit pieces of the puzzle together just so that I can be vigilant, right? And be aware and be sober. And as I do that, I've become very aware that there's going to, God is going to allow things to happen on this earth that you and I, maybe 10, 15 years ago, would have been surprised. God's going to allow that? Yeah. How do you know? Because he wrote it in his word. And, and one of the simple things, I'm not going to turn to it because we're going to study it when we get to that point comes out of what's going to happen with the Antichrist in the end times, 2 Thessalonians 2. And, you know, one of the things that it says is, is that he's going to be able, this Antichrist and his false prophet, are going to be able to, to cause so much confusion on the earth, so much deception. They're going to perform miracles. And, and what's going to happen is, is that the spirit of deception is going to come over so many people. And, 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 and they're going to be blinded. And they're going to be deceived. And, and you know what it says in 2 Thessalonians 2? It actually tells you why this is going to happen. It says God allowed it to happen. You know why? Because people would rather believe a lie than the truth. Right. It says it. It says that people preferred a lie instead of the truth. And so they, because they preferred a lie instead of the truth that God was trying to give them, then guess what he's going to do? He's going to give them a lie. And they're, and they're going to believe it. So what I'm trying to say is this, is that I know for a fact that there's going to be some things that are going to happen before it's all said and done because the word of God says it's going to happen and God's going to allow it to happen. God's written that it's going to happen. The enemy knows it's going to happen, but guess what? It ain't going to happen one second sooner than the Lord with the keys of David says, I'm going to open this door now and let it happen. In the meantime, this door is closed and it's locked. I'll open it up a little bit whenever I see fit. But it's not going to go down until the Lord says it's going to go down. So guess what, Christian? Don't get so frustrated. Don't get so... Look, look, three years ago, and I'm not telling you to go vote. You do what you want to do. But three years ago, I said, I ain't never voting again. And after this last election, I probably felt the same way again. But guess what? No, I'm still going to get up and I'm going to vote. And let me tell you why. Because I grew up in this country and so far they are still allowing me to vote. <laughs> and so guess what? Even if they... I don't know, some people might not agree, even if they still in elections. And I'm telling you right now, you got some crazy stuff, but you may not even believe that, and that's fine. You tell people your preacher's crazy, or don't tell them that. I don't know. But I'm telling you right now, they got some... Dude, did you not see some of that stuff they showed on those videos? What was them three suitcases that they pulled out at the last minute in that voting place? Was that, was that nothing? Anyway, I'm just trying to say, when, when it's all said and done, it's not going to happen until God says it's going to happen. And the door is closed. And when God opens it up, then it's going to be able to happen. So in the meantime, you and I need to be praying. Amen. You and I need to be praying. We need to be praying that the Lord would allow the righteous to rule and the righteous re rule the people rejoice. Amen. We need to be praying that God would, would, would protect us. We need to be praying that God would protect the sovereignty of our nation so that we can continue to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because that's really what I believe that this whole country was founded for to begin with. Yeah. Amen. So he's got the keys of David and no man's going to open the door except for him. And no man's going to close the door except for him. But we certainly, he expects us to partner with him and to believe. Amen. He says, I know the work, your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door. See, that's encouraging to me. I pray this a lot. 
I, I, I pray this a lot. Sometimes I think I accidentally say window. <laughs> so if you ever hear me say that, that's what this is the verse I'm praying right here. God, Jesus says, I have the keys of that. It's so hot in here. I thought earlier, man. Oh my goodness, great. You're right, brother. I saw, uh, I saw, um, Hannah being miserable, but I was hot during soul service. We need it. We need it. Chris, we need some remote control service back. All right. <laughs> So the Lord is going to, he said, he said he's got the keys of David and he's the one that opens them. And look what he says. And I've given you an open door. Now, listen, he was speaking right here to Sardis, but I'm here to tell you that the Lord wants to give you and I an open door to preach the gospel. Amen. It's always been his will, not just for Sardis then, not till the very end when he locks the door while it is day. You know, work while it is day. The Lord said it. Work while it is day. The night comes when no man can work. And God wants you and I to be able to work. And he's given us an open door for us to be able to work. And how do we work? We let God change us. We put the word of God in us. We ask for more of the Holy Spirit to flow in and through us. And guess what we do? We take Jesus with us where we go and we minister the Lord to other people. And by the grace of God... We ask God to give us wisdom that then we don't get caught up in a mess to where we get distracted and we're no longer vigilant and we're no longer sober and we're no longer watchful and we're no longer aware. Amen? So we have an open door. He says, no man can shut it for you have a little strength and you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, look at this. This is interesting stuff. I wish we had more time, but we don't to really break this down. But I want you to see this because there's another scripture that says it. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. There's another scripture earlier in the book of Revelation that basically says the same thing. It's Revelation chapter 2, verse 9. We've already been there. But look, I know your works and tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. I know the, the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. You see that? I mean, that, dude, that, that's saying a mouthful. I don't know if you kind of like, <clears throat> I don't know if you think like I do. Maybe some people think I think a little too deep, but whenever I'm, whenever I'm seeing this happening repeatedly and I'm trying to think, you know, so I start digging, right? And I know I've shared some of this with you, but re repetition is a beautiful teaching tool. Uh, and 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 one of the things that I've said is that those the Jews that we see at the Wailing Wall, this may be a, it might be offensive the first time you hear this, um, but hopefully it won't offend you so bad that you won't keep coming back to church. But those what they call Hasidic Jews that sit down at the wailing wall with those little curly cues, that's not even real Judaism. I'm just telling you right now, that's called Bible, right? Which is an Eastern, which is a, it, it was developed in the Jewish religion. And it, in my opinion, it dates all the way back to the Exodus when the mixed, the mixed multitude was with the children of Israel. But you can definitely find roots of it in the intertestamental period which is during the Maccabean revolt and all that stuff before, right? It wasn't called Kabbalah quite then, but it wasn't long. It was already in existence, and it, and now it's known as Kabbalah. So what I'm trying to tell you is, is that there's something to what Jesus is saying right here. He's warning us and he's letting us know that not everything that calls itself Jew is really the real Jew. Okay, there are real Jews. I just don't know who they are and where they are. And some people may not even know. And but 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 the, those people right there are not practicing true Judaism. So they say that they're. And, and I'm not an anti-Semite. I love the Jewish people that are true Jewish people because they're God. God called them, and through Abraham, He gave us Jesus. Amen. Um, and He's not done with them. I don't believe that God's done with the nation of Israel. Amen. I believe that again He's going to use Israel in the past, and I believe that many are going to get saved, and many are getting saved. All right. They say that they're Jews and they're not, but they lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. 
Well, that's interesting. Because still today, there's people that are very, very strong in their Jewishness or whatever, you know what I'm saying? And that they do not, they, they believe that basically Christians are, you know, I mean, it's, I don't want to get into the details of it, but they do not think highly of Christians at all. And what the Lord's saying is, is that those that are of the house of the synagogue of Satan, I'm going to make them come and worship at your feet. <laughs> because the idea is, is that we're going to already be worshiping at the feet of the Lord. The, I believe the idea is because he's not wanting to elevate and exalt you and I. I don't believe that. I mean, yeah, in his own way, but it, it all comes up under him. Amen. It's all for his glory. And, and what's going to happen is, is that the world one day is going to know. The Bible says every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. It's going to happen. Right now. And you and I, hopefully, and prayerfully, we're already coming to that place in our walk with God where we're slowly surrendering and bowing our knee to Jesus. Amen? And he says, they will know that I have loved you because you have kept the word of my patience. Now, I want you to, I want you to see that. You kept the word of my patience. That word patience... Again, for y'all that have been here for quite some time, that's that word hupomone again, right? Y'all remember that word? Hupomone is a compound Greek word. Hupo means, uh, means under. Mone means remain. And so it means to remain under. So every time almost we see the word patience, it describes perseverance. It describes endurance. The whole context of this right here is to endure in hard times. Amen? Amen. Now, I want you to see, so when he's got a message to the church that you, to endure in a hard time. Amen? And he says, he says the word, he says, look, because you have kept the word of my patience, I also will keep you from the hour of temptation. Now, y'all already know, I've been very open with, hey, listen, I'm not trying to convince anybody to believe anything different than what they've already believed. I'm just telling you that I'm starting to see some things in the Word of God that I didn't see before. And this is a prime example because, look, people that believe in a pre-tribulation rapture look to this verse of Scripture. They use it. This is a big verse of Scripture for the pre-tribulation concept. Can we – does any – I mean, you don't have to raise your hand. You don't even have to shake your head. But do you, do you know what I'm talking about? You, you don't, I'm not going to look. You can, yeah. 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 Okay. So, when we're done talking about this, I'm just going to give you two different angles. <clears throat> and I'm not asking you to believe or to not believe the way that I am. I want you to believe what you desire to believe. But what I want you to know is, is that the word for, from there, can, so I'm going to keep you. And the idea, the, the, the idea means to sustain or, or to protect, okay? And so, but the word from right there, this, this word, can describe Either one of two things. It can be used in two different ways. Number one, it can be out of. So that's where people that believe in a pre-tribulation rapture would use this scripture to describe the fact that when the bad times come, because you believe the word of my patience, because you believe the word that I told you that you would have to endure, I'm going to take you out of Okay, this time. But the word can also mean... To get you through. It can also mean to take you through. And so I just want you to know that it's got two different concepts behind it. For, you know, and so now what we're trying to do is we're trying to build upon. And when it's all said and done, I did ask y'all a long time ago to start sending me scriptures that, that, that support a preacher. I haven't gotten one yet, but that's okay. We still got time. But at some point in time, what I want us to do is I want us to. So write a list, pre-tribulation scriptures, and then another list that says, but what is this? This is kind of questioning it because I'm just trying to get to the bottom of it. That's all I'm trying to do. Amen. So it, this one here is a big one. And I'm just letting you know that right off the bat, you can look it up in your Strong's. You can, you know, you can read other people. Now you got it. What you got to remember is, is that if you read behind People that have a certain way of thinking that that's the typically the position that they're going to continue to believe. Amen. And, and if you read behind somebody that believes a different way, then that's the position. I'm just trying. I'm telling you right now, I'm just trying to be fair to everybody and to find what is, is actually saying. So my question is, if the word itself can mean out of or can mean, mean to be brought through, is that scripture alone enough? To really hang your hat on the fact that you may not have to find or go through 
and, or endure. And see, that's really all we're trying to do is prepare for, for the, a time of endurance if we have to face that, right? Amen? Amen. All right. So, which, and look what it says. Because you have kept the word of my endurance, I also will keep you, let's say it both ways. I also will take you out of, or I also will bring you through the hour of temptation, the season of temptation, the season of trial and tribulation, the season of trying. See, that's what the word temptation really means, to be put to trial, to be tried. Just like you put metal under a fire and you melt it and all the impurities begin to come to the top. That's what this word literally means. It means to put to the test. And so the whole, and then look what it says, this time of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to try them that dwell upon the earth. You know, sometimes you got to just stop and you got to think about concepts. And I, cause that's what I do. I, sometimes I think about concepts, but why God, why, if it's not exactly what I always thought it was, why would you cause your church to have to go through a time of trial? Right? I mean, is that not a legitimate question to ask? Well, then an even better question would ask, why did you allow them to go through <laughs> trial from day one? <laughs> Why did you allow Mark to get drugged through the streets of Egypt? Why did you allow Thomas to get run through with a Brahmin sword? Why did you allow Peter to be crucified upside down? Why did you allow Paul to get his head cut off under the emperor Nero? Why did you allow, I don't remember who it was. Was it Justin Martyr that wrote the letter while he was on the ship coming back to Rome? I will be food for these lions. Why did you allow all of these people to go through all of these things? Why did you allow the Syrian Christians to get burned in cages. Why are you still allowing all of this? Listen, I'm going to tell you one thing. The Lord had to go through something. Come on. People before have had to go through something. I'm not trying to tell you that word, but this is why. This is the concept on why, because guess what? Just like everything that calls itself Jew ain't Jew, everything that calls itself Christian ain't Christian, my friend. Right. Right. right now in the midst of the world, it's always been that way. The liar has always infiltrated the church. He's always been in. Why did we think that he wouldn't still be here today? He's gotten better at disguising himself, especially with human wisdom and human intellect and new age thought. He's gotten better at hiding himself. So guess what? It makes perfect sense to me conceptually that God will allow the whole world, maybe even the church, to go through a trial period, a, a drawing in the land and the line. You remember whenever, listen, y'all ever heard the story of Moses? You remember on the day that Moses went up and he got the law, what happened? He comes down and they all having a party, right? Aaron had allowed them to burn their, their earrings and melt and create golden calves. And they're over there like, they're acting like a bunch of pagans. And what did, what did Moses say? Moses said, Choose you basically this day. He didn't say it like this, but this is what he said. Choose you this day who you will serve. Whose side are you on? And then the ones that said, oh, we kind of like these golden calves, man. We want to keep doing this. He said, guess what? He told the Levites, kill them. 3,000 men died that day. Now, the beauty is, is on the day that the church was formed and the Holy Spirit fell, amen, 3,000 people got saved. What I'm trying to say is that a trial like this, you know what it would do? It would be a separating line. It would put to the test. And it would see who's really in and who's really out. Yep. Who's really going to serve the Lord? Amen. I do believe that we're going to know. I don't believe it's going to be something as simple as, you know, what people are saying today. I believe you're going to know whenever, like, you're going to have to give your allegiance to something else. You're going to have to turn. And that's what they were doing in Rome in the, in the New Testament times. They were having to worship the emperor. They were having to bring sacrifice to the emperor. And if they didn't, they were being killed. Okay, so it's going to come upon the whole world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which you have and let no man take your crown. Amen. Don't let any man take your crown. Don't let any man convince you of something that is not right. And that in the end you lose your Stephanos. That's the Greek word right there. This, the victor's crown. You remember that little... That little leafy thing that them Olympians would wear. Don't let anybody take your Stephanos, man. It's the victor's crown the Lord has given you. 
power to have victory. Amen. Now, this is interesting. Him that overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. Well, there's a lot that we could break down there, but I'm going to get you out of here. But one, one thing that, I, that is interesting to me, so I, I don't need you to raise your hand. Because that would be, you know, kind of weird with me in the competition. But I know some of y'all in here have read the whole Bible. And I'm just wondering, when you hear him that overcomes, because again, this is another overcoming message. When you hear him that overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. When you hear that word pillar, does that, does that make you think of something that you read before in the Bible? I'm not going to keep you hanging too long. Yes. That, yes? Yes. Yeah, can go ahead. You want to shout out? The two pillars in yes. Solomon's Thank you, sir. The two pillars in the Old Testament. Right? <laughs> Solomon's, Solomon's, Solomon's temple. temple. Thank you. Jacob and Boaz. Right. And Jacob was a leader of the priests under the under the kingdom of David. Right. And who was Boaz? Boaz was Ruth's husband. <laughs> the Bible. You got to read the book of Ruth, man. That's some beautiful stuff right there. You know what the Bible says about Boaz in the Old Testament? It says he was the kinsman redeemer. I wish we had time to preach about a kinsman redeemer tonight. But a kinsman redeemer is a is a like one who redeemed. And listen, Ruth was a Gentile woman, and he was a Jew, and he was the redeemer of this Gentile woman. What I'm here to tell you is that you're a Gentile bride, church. And Jesus was the bridegroom and he's your kinsman redeemer. What do you mean you're, he's my kinsman? He's your relative, man. Because the children, Hebrews 2.14, were partakers of flesh and blood. He became the same. Jesus became the same as you, not with sin, but without sin. Why? So he could die for you. So he could redeem you. Amen. So that you could become a pillar in the temple of God. Hallelujah. God wants you and I to overcome so that we could be a pillar in the temple of God. Amen. Thank you, Jesus.